Okay, so this is gonna be my 50,000 subscriber Q&A. So I got a bunch of questions and I'm excited to go over some. So the first one is from Good Place to Stop and he has a bunch of questions. The first one is, what are your best places to stop? Well, I think there are three good places to stop. Maybe when you're done with the problem, that's a good place. When you're out of time, that's also a good place. And then maybe when you get so confused you don't know what to do for the next step, that's also a good place to stop. You know, maybe there are some others. You guys can post them in the comments. Okay, so the next question is, explain to me like I'm five your research topic. So maybe this is not like you're five, but it's pretty close. So imagine a triangle. And so if you have an equilateral triangle, it has um, some symmetry to it, like you can fold it in half and it folds on itself. You can rotate it and it rotates into itself and so on and so forth. Well, so um, a big part of my research is looking at these symmetries of certain algebraic objects and these algebraic objects are called vertex operator algebras. So I've written a bunch of papers on these like symmetries that are inside of these vertex operator algebras they're called orbifolds. Um, I'm actually thinking about eventually doing a series where not only do I like introduce like the notion of uh, vertex algebras and you know building up to my research but maybe like make some videos on the papers that I've written. I don't think there'll be a huge audience, but on the other hand, I think it's something that maybe should be on the internet. I think maybe more researchers should be making videos about their serious research projects and putting them on YouTube. So maybe I'll start doing that. Okay, post in the comments if you think maybe you're not interested in it, but if you think that's something that should exist on the internet. Okay, so third question, is zero a natural number? Well, if you want me to be completely honest about it, I don't really care. We just have to make a decision when we're working on a problem. And uh, whenever I do all of the problems that I use zero not as a natural number, the problems actually read um, solve over all positive integers. So they're very careful to say that they do not include zero as part of the solution. I'm just lazy and I put the element of the natural numbers when I write it on the chalkboard. Um, so, you know, I don't like to get caught up in these like little semantics if zero is or is not a natural number. I don't think it's really that big of a deal. Okay, so any good or bad experiences with students that I'd like to tell? Well, you know, yeah, I've had a bunch of good experiences. Um, one of my favorite things to do is direct students in independent projects and research, and I've had some good success doing that in the past. I like the relationship that you can build with students when you're doing that. Um, and it's really nice to see someone start a project that seems super hard, um, but eventually they figure out how to work through all of the details and everyone comes up kind of stronger in the end. And bad experiences? Well, yeah, of course I've had bad experiences, but I'm not sure the internet is the place to talk about those. Okay, so next. So the next question is maybe favorite mathematicians in history and why? So to be honest, I'm not a great scholar on the history of mathematics. I taught a first year experience class once where we dived into history of math and I learned lots of nice stories about Euler and Newton and Leibniz and stuff like that. And those are all very interesting. But maybe, you know, just offhand, I am really inspired by Emmy Noether and her contributions to mathematics and physics and kind of overcoming being um, a woman in mathematics back in the day when that was like not something that happened. Okay. So do I follow any sports like soccer, football, basketball, baseball? I don't follow any of those sports. Um, I follow competition rock climbing because I am involved in rock climbing as a hobby. I follow some Olympic sports like diving and gymnastics because I did those when I was younger. Um, I follow bicycle racing. Uh, I'm not really sure why I commute on my bicycle to work sometimes, so it's kind of interesting for me for that reason. And I follow Olympic weightlifting. and. Also, I'm not really sure why I follow that. I do perform like the Olympic lifts as exercise sometimes, so maybe that's why I'm interested in that. So what is a typical day for me? So while I was at Colorado College where they have this thing called the block plan where everyone's like essentially doing one thing at a time, like taking one class or teaching one class, I really learned that 
I would focus my day on different things kind of depending on what my goals were. So I'll have a block of a couple of weeks where I'm working really hard on research problems and a block of some time where teaching is really my focus, block of some time where now I'm making YouTube videos. I like to have a bunch of the summer where I'm focused mostly on climbing um, and then maybe a break every once in a while. But I have to say that maybe I don't really have a typical day. Generally, I'm doing some sort of exercise. Generally, I'm doing some something that's related to my job, like teaching or making these videos or doing some research or having like meetings and stuff at my college on the committees. Um, but, you know, it changes from day to day. So this next bit of questions is from Calcboy. So maybe the first one is, what do you think are the qualities for a mathematical researcher? I think the most important quality for any academic researcher is just working hard and not giving up. And I think there's actually research to show that this is true. I read a book which really changed my thought process on all of this, including the idea of inherent talent. It was called Grit by Lauren Duckworth. Anyway, I really highly suggest it. There are a bunch of YouTube videos of some other people talking about this book, but the main thrust of this book is that hard work is the most important deciding factor when it comes to success in essentially everything, but the academics and academic research is actually the biggest field where this makes the biggest difference. And then next, is Olympiad experience to study math at higher levels research? Um, no, I didn't do mathematical Olympiads when I was younger. I, um, not because I wasn't interested, I didn't know they existed. I didn't really grow up in an environment where this kind of thing was pushed on me or really common at all. So maybe I wish I had done some mathematical competitions or Olympiads when I was younger, but I didn't. And um, I think what you'll find is that solving an Olympiad problem and doing a research problem is totally different. Olympiad problems are essentially always going to have fairly short solutions, but there's just a lot of tricks. And research type problems often don't have short solutions and there often aren't tricks. You just have to kind of pound it with um, frustrating work for a long time. So the next question is about who I follow on YouTube. So as far as math YouTubers, I watch Numberphile and I watch Stand Up Maths. I watch essentially all of the big ones. And then I'm in contact with other math YouTubers that are kind of in my niche. In other words, in the like do a math problem niche. Like Blackpin Redpin, he's been really helpful when I was growing my channel from the very beginning. Um, I talked to Dr. Payam a little bit. I think his channel is great. I talked to Professor Omar Math quite a bit. I think his channel is great. We're, we've got a lot of stuff that we're going to do in the future together. Um, I don't watch their channels a ton, but that's mostly because I don't have a lot of time. And I find that watching channels in my exact niche could be a little bit harmful for my creativity. As far as other con content creators, so I watch a lot of like camera and audio um, YouTubers, mostly because my real goal is to get a high production quality out of this. I want to upgrade my, upgrade my camera setup in the next couple of months and see if I can start doing everything in 4K. That should be interesting. Um, I watch uh, Marquez Brownlee. I think he does really good tech type reviews. I'm pretty inspired by um, daily vlog style, like Casey Neistat stuff. I like the energy in those. Um, <clears throat> I also follow some rock climbing YouTubers like Magnus Mitbo or Epic TV or Geek Climber. Um, and all in all, I watch kind of a lot of different channels on YouTube. Okay, so next question. Okay, so there are a lot of questions kind of about my outside hobbies and maybe like my workout routine and climbing and stuff like that. So maybe I'll just cover all of those in one and maybe I'll put some clips of climbing and other stuff kind of over this while I'm talking. So essentially my biggest hobby and kind of what drives all of this stuff is rock climbing. So I've been climbing for like 12 or 15 years or something at this point at a pretty high level. So um, I mostly do sport climbing and my favorite place to go sport climbing is either like the New River Gorge, which is pretty close to my house, maybe two hours and a half or three hours away in West Virginia. Um, I climb there quite a bit over the winter when it's cooler. And in the summer, I like to go to Rifle in Colorado. Um, my hardest climb, so 
by grade, my hardest climb is this thing called the Crew, which is in Rifle, Colorado. It's 14C or 18 or 8C plus. Um, my first really hard climb that I was proud of was called China Beach, which was in Rumney, New Hampshire, which is 8C or 14B. Climbed a couple of other 14s, uh, maybe three or four more 14Bs and some 14As um, or 8Cs and 8B pluses. Um, maybe one of the hardest routes, but it isn't like as technically difficult as everything else, but it was just really hard for me because of my style was this thing called living in fear, which is 13 D or eight B. It took me forever, even though it's like quite a bit quote easier than some others that I've done. Um, in the past, I've done a fair bit of bouldering, although not so much anymore. Um, I've bouldered quite a bit in Waco tanks, which is outside of El Paso, Texas, climbing up to V12 there. I did Wright Martini, so that's like 8A plus boulder. Um, I've climbed several V11s there as well, like Diaphanous C and others. I did full service, which is like one of the maybe fa most famous V10s in the country. It's there, that's really good. I've done some hard boulders in um, Great Barrington, Massachusetts as well, like something from nothing and some other things in like the V9 to V11 range there as well. And essentially my workout routine is based around my climbing. So I do a lot of like weighted pull-ups. I do some one-arm pull-ups. I do some fingerboarding, which is where you hang from like an edge. I hang with extra weight to make my grip stronger for climbing. I have this thing called a tension board at home. So maybe I'll put a clip of me climbing on the tension board. I use that for training. I'll train on the campus board a little bit. And then um, sometimes I'll do like Olympic style weightlifting for training. So I'll do like power snatches or like power cleans or deadlifting or like a little bit of squatting. Sometimes I uh, do box jumps and stuff like that. Um, I'm kind of intense about the whole thing, um, as you can maybe imagine from everything that I'm saying right now. Um, and then I just started back up springboard diving so i was a diver when i was in college i competed at indiana university maybe i'll put some clips of that up right here so um although right now the pool is closed because of the virus or whatever um i intend to like start doing that in the future maybe compete in like some masters events because it's pretty fun um one of the main driving reasons i do that is because my kid who's like nine showed some interest in starting diving um, but and then since I have a background, you know, I looked into it for him and uh, to be honest, I didn't just want to sit in the stands and watch him. So I asked the coach if I could like practice in the background while he was uh, taking his class and she said yes. So that was a, a good advantage for me. Um, OK, so let's move on to the next question. So the next question is, can you do a backflip tutorial? And I think you can probably find a better backflip tutorial on YouTube than one I could make. Um, I'm kind of bummed that I don't do backflips in videos anymore, but what you guys can't tell is that I upgraded my audio setup and I have these microphones hanging just out of frame. And so I think my feet would hit them if I did backflips anymore. So uh, unfortunately with the updated audio, I had to lose the backflip board erase. So that was kind of a bummer. <laughs> So the next question is about math a little bit. So what's the longest time I've spent on a proof or a problem university? So it was a long time since I was a student. So I don't really remember how long my homework sets or the problems I worked on really took. I know that um, now all of the problems I work on are research type problems. And you know, it takes a while to write a research paper. You know, generally I have uh, two or three going at the same time and um, they can take, you know, between a couple months and a little bit over a year to write the whole thing. But obviously there's a lot more to that than just doing the math problem. Um, you have to write it down, which is like kind of the bummer part of it. Doing the math problem is the fun part. Uh, the next question is uh, Z2, Z mod 2 or Z mod 2Z. This is going to be kind of the same as my answer for the natural numbers. And it's like, I don't care. I think I've written uh, papers where I've used all three of those in, in different papers. So, you know, I'm open to any of them. Um, I will say that sometimes Z2 is used for something else. So if you want to be super precise, it would be like Z mod 2 or Z mod 2Z. But, you know, generally by context, context people can figure out what you're talking about. 
So next question is how did I find out about my research area and did I immediately love it or did it take a while? Okay, so I was always interested in kind of the mathematics of uh, modern physics, like string theory and stuff. And then it turned out that when I needed to choose an advisor in grad school, there was a new professor who did work in this field called vertex operator algebras, which I think is closely related to the field in physics called conformal field theory, which is somehow related to string theory. So I had left my studying of physics behind, but I still had that um, hint of interest. And so, you know, I chose him as an advisor and the rest is history. Um, did I immediately love it? Uh, I mean, sure. You know, it was fun. You know, I think I like a lot of different subjects in math, so I could probably could have studied anything and been happy. Um, I will say that looking back on my development as a mathematician, I'm surprised like how much you learn when school is done. I know so much more than I did even last year or the year before, needless to say, when I graduated. Um, and by graduate, I mean finish my PhD. So it's a continually, it's a continual learning process and I feel like I'm growing all of the time. Okay, so this next question is about math Olympiads. So it says, I really like your videos on math Olympiad problems, thank you. I want to join Olympiad competitions. Can you offer some advice, advice about how to get better at solving challenging math problems like those found on competitive exams? And another question, have you ever entered a math Olympiad before and how did you prepare for it? So I never entered a math Olympiad before. I did do the Putnam exam when I was in college. So I did that twice and I didn't really prepare for it. I am somewhat of a late bloomer in mathematics. Um, and I didn't really go to a school where people are prepared for the Putnam that much. Um, as far as how to get better at solving challenging math problems, I think it's all about practice. So try a problem, don't be afraid to read the solution, get yourself uh, a good source of references so that you can find new problems and read solutions to those problems. And really it's just a time game. So in mathematics competitions, there are lots of tricks. So those tricks are generally hard to come up with so you really have to look at other solutions or somehow be exposed to those tricks um, in some way in order to use them in future problems. So like I said, don't be afraid to look at solutions to problems. I think maybe watching videos or reading them, those are all good things to do. Okay, so this is a question about my YouTube channel. It says, hi Michael, I've been watching your videos since winter. Well, thanks. Um, how do you think your channel grew so fast? So that's essentially the question. And I don't really know the answer to that. Unfortunately, I think maybe I'm one of the few people that benefited from all of the shutdowns of the universities because people needed to see uh, videos online. I think that helped me and I was able to uh, kind of fill that role very quickly because I had already been doing it to flip my classes. Um, yeah, I'm really happy for all the growth and I hope it continues. Okay, so next, here's a couple of questions. Was math a passion from an early age or did you find an interest in it later on? So it was an interest from an early age. It was probably my best subject when I was in primary and secondary school. And it was not my original major in college. I originally majored in earth science, but it wasn't precise enough. So I moved to math because it was more precise. I think that's like pretty funny because a lot of people don't like math because of how precise it is, but uh, that really drew me. Um, I would say I didn't really blossom in mathematics until later. Like um, I was kind of a slacker in college and grad school. Um, but after grad school, um, I got more involved in research and doing all that other kind of stuff and obviously this YouTube channel. So um, I would say my skills in math have developed even since I've been out of school quite a bit. Um, any tips on being a math professor? It's been my dream, but I don't know how to give lectures or draw students' attention. Well, um, that's all just practice, right? I mean, the thing is, is when you go to grad school in math, generally maybe your first or second year, they have you teach a class. Um, and so you're kind of thrown into that game very, very quickly and you'll get a lot of chance to practice. Um, so, you know, don't, don't write yourself out just because you don't feel like you have the skill right now. A lot of that is just going to be you building the skill over time. And then is performing a backflip necessary for a mathematician or does it just come natural? I think it just comes naturally. Like all of a sudden I could do it. I don't know what to say.
Okay, so next question is, what did I do for my PhD? So um, I did something about principal subspaces of lattice vertex operator algebras, and then um, after that, I kind of wrote a bunch of papers on these principal subspaces for um, affine vertex algebras and like their twisted modules, whatever that means. Um, lately, I haven't been really working in that uh, sub subject so much I've been working on these things called orbifolds or maybe fixed point sub algebra sometimes people call them okay so next question is what motivated you to start a channel with such content what would you like to advise to students to excel at math okay so the second question I've answered kind of a lot already I think maybe it's just like hard work and learning to be really precise and internalizing all of the very careful definitions. That's, that's one of the really important things for excelling at math is that you have to have a good handle on the precise definitions for all of the parts, uh, maybe even above intuition. Um, the intuition will come later if you have a really good feel for uh, the precision of how the math is written. Um, what motivated me to start a channel? Well, I really wanted to spend class time when I was teaching my classes uh, with students doing problems and working together. I think it's a lot more fun. So I started putting um, these videos online so that I could do the lecturing part outside of class. And I wanted to make them shorter than lecture time so that people could split them up over a couple of different viewing um, periods. And also, I really want to balance them being correct and precise mathematically with being kind of laid back and informal. I think that maybe uh, makes it less intimidating to learn from. And then, you know, I noticed that no one was really putting time into making like really good thumbnails or a good production quality for these types of videos online. So there's like lots of videos on real analysis or algebra, but a lot of them are, you know, have don't that don't have that great audio or don't have that great video or the lighting is not good or the thumbnails aren't good. So I thought there was like a really nice hole to fit in there. Um, then um, as far as all the other stuff on my channel, well, it turns out that like, I really like some of the stuff on my channel that doesn't do so well. Like I really like the videos that I've made that are identities for Fibonacci numbers or identities for the Riemann zeta function or the dilogarithm function or stuff like that. Um, and those are like kind of my favorite videos that I've done. Although uh, you guys' favorite videos are all these competition videos. Not that I don't like them, they're, f they're fine. I like doing competition problems as well. Um, uh, but sometimes I wish all those other videos did a little better. Okay, so next question is, do I have any interest in physics or computer science or do I just enjoy maths? So yeah, I um, have a big interest in physics. In fact, I was a double major in college. My uh, personal research uh, has a lot to do with physics. When I go to conferences, there are physicists there, um, although I don't really know how they're physicists because their talks really seem like math talks to me, but you know, I know that they are physicists. They have jobs at physics departments. As far as computer science, I never took a computer science class, but I do a lot of um, coding in Mathematica or you know, other places in order to support research problems I'm working on sometimes. So the next question is analysis or algebra. And I would say that, uh, well, my personal research area is mostly algebraic, um, but I really enjoy teaching analysis type classes. I never thought I'd get a chance to, but you know, I've been teaching real analysis. This is my second semester coming up and I've t taught differential equations quite a few times now. Um, and those are really fun to teach. Um, so, I, I enjoy both and you know I enjoy both for maybe different reasons. I feel like an outsider kind of relearning whenever I'm doing analysis type stuff. Um, but uh, algebra type stuff feels a little bit more familiar and at home. Okay, so next question is about what you do when you get stuck on questions in assignments or competitions. So I would say uh, maybe three big things. So you could try to solve an easier version of the problem um, or maybe invent an easier version of the problem and try to solve that. Um, secondly, you could find someone to in detail explain the problem to as well as what you have tried in order to solve it. I feel like talking through it with someone else, even if they may not help you with the problem, can often like open up your creative ability to attack the problem. Um, 
because explaining it obviously requires you to think about it a little more deeply. Um, and then maybe third is uh, take a little break from it and try another problem if that's possible. Um, again, often you can find some sort of connection with another problem on accident, which would help you solve your original problem. Okay. So next question is, uh, do you do all the editing yourself or are there other people helping you along with the channel? Um, no, I do all of the filming and editing and everything myself, um, but it's not super hard to edit. Uh, I feel like maybe doing a math channel is easier than doing a lot of other channels because I just come down to my basement where I have this chalkboard and all of these lights set up and I push record. Um, I do the math problem and then I go upstairs and I edit it. It doesn't really take that long, um, which is how I'm able to put out so many videos, I guess. Um, as far as in the future, I don't know if I'll have an editor in the future. You know, I'm not totally against that, um, but I do want to travel when it's a little more appropriate to travel and like have some maybe guests on the channel that aren't involved in YouTube at all. Like uh, some of my collaborators that I've written papers with could show you guys like some interesting problems or um, I'd like to start bringing my filming gear to conferences and maybe have people show interesting problems during the breaks at conferences or maybe even some of the conference talks like kind of highlight what it's like behind the scenes. Um, that's like one of my big goals is to give a window into um, what happens in the life of a mathematician outside of a college or university or something. Um, so post in the comments if you think that would be a good idea. I'm going to probably do it even if no one thinks it's a good idea because I think it's a good idea and it would be fun. Um, but I, you know, I know people are supposed to comment because it helps this video get uh, suggested. So maybe do that, I guess. Um, okay, great. Go. That's a good place to stop.